So I'm struck this week by the challenge of the Bible. I mean, certainly the Bible always challenges us in, in some way, uh, whether it is uh, we're challenged to change, we're challenged to maybe believe something that, uh, that we struggled with, we are challenged to trust in God more. Uh, every page, every book, in a little bit different way, a lot of cases, challenges us in some way. If we are reading our Bible and we're not being challenged, uh, perhaps that's the challenge, that we need to have a greater sense of the Spirit within us. It is the Spirit that explains, points out, enlightens all the things that the Spirit does, the Scripture that we're reading. So if we're reading it, and it's just words on a page, and, and we read our, you know, our paragraph or, or chapter or whatever we're reading, and we didn't get challenged in some way, um, my suggestion to you would be go back and have the Holy Spirit aid you in that reading. What struck me challenging was this past section we've been reading in Romans. Um, we've been given this fantastic news, right? We're free. We are a free people. We are free um, from, from sin being our master. We are alive in Christ, dead to sin. We're given all this. And then he added a bit more over the past couple of passages. He said, you are in Christ. Uh, the Mosaic law is, is dead to you. The Mosaic law is gone. Yes and no. And, and so you're, you're trying to take all that in. Romans is not a, a casual reading book. I don't think it's ever been made into a children's book because it is really challenging. Paul can seem to be saying two different things. You're this, but you're this. You know, you, you have this freedom, uh, but, but you're still uh, falling under sin all the time. So, you know, what's, what's it all about? And the genius of the way he has presented this with this series of rhetorical questions and then, of course, the immediate answer, uh, the genius of that is he's leading up to this very, very personal section that we're going to read today. We give thanks, of course, for the good news that he gives us. You know, we're, we're overjoyed. We should be celebrating every week the good news. We are free. We're dead to sin. It doesn't have any, any uh, power over us unless we let it. That's, that's where, where he goes with these things. You're dead to sin. Dead. And the dead don't sin. I, I don't know how many different ways he said that. And so sin shouldn't be your master. As soon as he says that, he's implying something. Sin might still be your master. Shouldn't be, but might still be because you're allowing it to be. Now we begin to see the underlying challenge that he's giving in all of these things. Everything on the surface, perfect sense. Everything that he says on the surface, yeah, we agree with it. Yeah, that's... That's genius. You're right. But there's something much, much deeper underneath all the things that he's saying here. See, so much of the burden, so much of the challenge comes from the fact that we hear these things, we read these things, but we have a hard time believing these things. And here's what I mean. Our experience... Well, maybe this isn't your experience. I'll say this is my experience. I believe what Paul says, that I am dead to sin. I believe in here that I am freed from the tyranny of sin, and yet I still stumble and fall. Does that sound familiar? Somebody else maybe? Okay. So I try to bring those two truths together. I'm free, dead to sin, no tyranny of sin, and yet still sin finds its way into my life. Okay, how is this happening? Either I don't understand what he's saying or I'm not applying what he's saying. And I think it's the latter more than the former. We've broken it down passage by passage. 
And he has repeated himself over and over and over. So yeah, we are clear. We died in Christ to sin. I get that. All of us get that. Sin is not our master. We get that. Christ is our master. So far, so good. The struggle we have is believing in that freedom. Believing and trusting in that freedom. Believing that the spirit within us can get us past the temptation, the, the stumbling, the, the outright rebellion. The spirit can bring us past that. And it's getting to that point that is the essence of what Paul is saying here. Christianity is, is not a religion of external rules. That's why he talked about the law. We don't refer to the you know, Ten Commandments on the back wall each week to make sure we're in line because what happens as soon as we see a rule written down, we start working the edges of it. That's our nature. We start, well, well, he didn't say I couldn't look at my neighbor's tractor. I didn't look at his wife, his donkey. His, I didn't do any of that. So as soon as we start playing that, that edge game there, well, then, you know, we're, we're tempted. And then we start making new rules that say, well, it's, it's okay to look at the tractor, but not the car. And, and so this is, this is what humans do. This is what they've done all through that. And the, then when we go back and we read what Paul says here, oh, I, I get it. I, I am free. And we try to line it up with that experience. When we have external rules like that, when we set everything externally, when we make laws that, that we're going to find our way around, when we do that, we fail to trust in the Spirit. We fail to trust in the Holy Spirit that Christ has given us and put inside us to dwell in us so that we're not looking at the technical aspects of the rule. What we're doing is looking at the essence of the rule. Why? Why does the last commandment say, don't covet your neighbor's stuff? Well, it's not because you, you're going you're gonna to be tempted to steal your neighbor's stuff. It's because you should trust in what God has provided for you. And God has provided differently for every single one of us. If I am longing, constantly looking over the fence at my neighbor's stuff, I am communicating to God through thought and action and in my heart. I am shaping my heart to say, yeah, I have this perfectly beautiful truck right here, but oh my gosh, my neighbor's truck is so much cleaner. And I'm telling God that I don't trust his provision. I am not grateful for his provision. And that is true of all of the commandments, all of the external rules. It is not the rule itself. It is the essence of the rule. The first four rules of the Ten Commandments are honor God above all. Now, it's spelled out four different ways, but that's it. Right? Honor God above all. Then the last group is this is how you live together. This is why Jesus said, when confronted, what is the first and greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. I, I'm adding words, but you get the point. Love the Lord your God. And then what does he say? <gasps> and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Don't covet their stuff. Don't steal from them. Don't lie about them. Don't do those things. And all that relies on the spirit. All that relies on us trying less and trusting more. That's what Paul's driving us to. Try less. Stop looking at things externally and trying to force yourself into this mold of holiness that you have in vision. Try less. Trust more. Trust the spirit that Christ has put in you more than you do this second. Now this series of rhetorical questions, it's going to come to an end. He's going to bring it to a conclusion this week with one last question. And so the, the biggest challenge, of course, we find is that we, we're trying to live up to what Paul has tested us with. Do you think this? 
well, don't do that. Do you think this? Don't do that. He, so he's done this over and over. And he's given us these, these ideas, these things we could form into maxims. These would be good for coffee cups, right? Grace is great. Yeah, okay, got it. Okay, so don't do anything without thinking of grace. The challenge he gave was, should we sin more so that God gives us more grace? No. Obviously, no is the answer to that. He told us we were dead to sin, that sin has no power over us. So should we take that for granted? No. No, you should not take God's grace for granted. You should not put sin over here like it's nothing. You should not do any of those things. You know, what about the Mosaic Law? This was the thing he, he questioned in our last passage. What about the Mosaic Law? And he says, well, you're dead to the Mosaic Law, but all of the principles of the Mosaic Law still apply to you. Wow. Here, there, here, there, here, there, here, there. And so when you read it, if you read it just on the page, you read just letters on the page, you feel like you're going back and forth. Like Paul's trying to trick you a little bit, right? He gives you this question, you know the right answer, but, but what if you accidentally gave the right answer? Well, Paul gives you the answer. Should we sin more so grace abounds more? No way. Should we take this for granted? No. Does the Mosaic law apply to you? No. Do the principles of the Mosaic apply to you? Yes. So we're given this, we're going back and forth like that man in the book of James, back and forth and back and forth. And we, we don't know what it is. Here's the thing that's underlying all this. This is why you have to read Romans continuously. Because Paul has set all this up by talking about grace. Paul has set all this up by talking about the incredible grace before he started into this series of rhetorical questions, what was the great thing that he said in chapter 5? While you were still enemies of God, Christ died for you. That's the foundation of all this. You, you and I should have melted down to absolutely nothing because we recognize that all this, all salvation, all grace, all everything comes from God. We have no part in it. While we were his enemies, we didn't have to clean up, we didn't have to change, we didn't have to start doing something else. No, while we were the enemies of God, Christ ascended the cross and died for us. We all just melted into the ground at that. And now he's starting to build it up. He said, now, you're going to be tempted to think this. Don't do that. You're going to be tempted to do this. Don't do that. Remember grace. Remember grace. Remember grace all the way down. And here's the challenge that I brought up a second ago. We all believe in that grace. We all live by that grace. We've been saved by that grace. We believe up here that we are free from the tyranny of sin. And yet, we still find ourselves stumbling. And that's why Paul comes to this most personal section. So we are in chapter 7, and we're going to begin in verse 13 today as he gives us a solution to understanding this, this back and forth challenge that we face Starting in verse 13, one more rhetorical question. Actually, I'm going to back up one because this answers this. So in verse 12, Paul said, So then, the law is holy, it's good because it was given by God, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Okay, so then he picks up in verse 13. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. I know. You distill this down. God gave the law 
God gave the law so that we would know what sin is. If we were playing football, if we were playing baseball, if we were playing any game that had boundaries to it, and we do away with the boundary lines, half the game goes away. No goal lines in football, right? No base paths in baseball. No lines around the tennis court. Name the game. If any of those boundaries go away, well, all of a sudden you're shooting three pointers from up in the stands, right? You don't worry about your serve going in. You just hit it over the net and call it good. The law works the same way. God didn't give the law to like clamp down on us and make us this rigid group of people. He showed us what the boundaries were. Honor God, honor your neighbors, all will be well. But what happens is we look at the law differently. We look at the law, I think we talked about this in Sunday school, we look at it legalistically. Okay, technically, what did God mean by that? We, we could spend weeks tearing apart the Ten Commandments, but they're never meant to be torn apart. They're never meant to be analyzed. They're, they're meant to be understood as this code for living as God's people and among God's people. They are the boundary markers for what we do. Anytime we are in, within the boundaries, we are fine. Stay within the boundaries, play hard, you're fine. But the boundary marker tells us that when we get outside that line, we've broken the rules. We have failed God. And so what Paul is saying is the law was given so that you would know what sin is. The law is given so that you could identify actions that come naturally to you. Maybe it's anger. Maybe you get angry with people too easily. Okay, well, if I don't know that that's a bad thing, I let it keep going in me and I become angrier. But when I recognize that I should not be looking at my neighbor in that way, I should be a person of peace with my neighbor in that way, then I know, because God has laid out the boundaries of human relationship, then, oh, I've stepped outside of this, I need to get back into that. So Paul is saying the, the law itself is good. God gave it. It is good. It is holy. It is right. But grace is what marks out your life. Grace is what marks out your life. Not this rigid set of rules, but people who live by grace. And so he picks up in, this, in the next verse, in verse 14. Now he's, he's going to confess now. And listen... This little passage I'm going to read right here is one of the most misapplied passages in this book for sure and sometimes in the Bible as a whole. Listen to what Paul says. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I lose count of the number of times people have pointed to that and use that as their get out of jail free card. Well, you know, I can't control this. I, I, it's, it's, I, it, it's out of control in me. I say, oh, that's not what that says. You say they point at Paul, the super Christian, right? The apostle who just lays down the majority of the church and the doctrine and all this. And they say, see, Paul's a sinner. I say, well, okay, Paul's never not said he wasn't a sinner. And they're saying, well, but look, he can't control himself. Why do you keep telling me I have to control myself? I said, well, okay, that's not what Paul says. You have to read this in the context of the entire thing. Paul is confessing 
that he's recognizing that there are these two people fighting inside of him, that there are these two natures at war inside of him. One is his master, and the other is working around the edges of his heart, looking for opportunities to poke holes in the master's story. So we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. Paul's saying in himself, he is a fallen man. He recognizes, yes, grace has come into his life. Christ has radically transformed him. The Holy Spirit dwells in him, and yet he remains a fallen human being, which is true of all people. We are fallen human beings given the blessing of God's grace, given the blessing of his spirit dwelling within us. And so Paul says these two things are constantly in you and they're going to be, they're going to be battling with each other. What I do not want to do, I'm, I'm sorry, what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. There it is. These two natures. He's saying, I don't want to sin, and yet I look down and I have stepped over the boundary marker. Or I let my anger or some other emotion get the best of me, and all of a sudden it erupts out. I didn't want to do that. I don't want to do that. And yet all of a sudden it's there. So in light of grace, in light of the law being dead to us, all those things, in light of that, Paul says, you have got to recognize. You have got to recognize you have these two natures. You have the spirit of Christ dwelling in you, and that spirit of Christ dwells in there in that fallen heart of yours. Remember what I said a minute ago, trust more. Try less, trust more. This is what Paul is saying throughout all these questions. He's saying essentially this. You, in your nature, cannot meet the standards of God. It is impossible. You cannot be holy as God is holy. You cannot be fully set apart as God would have you be in your own power. And that's why Paul is being confessional here. He recognizes his position in the church. He recognizes that people look up to him as this kind of super apostle. And they say, well, well, Paul, you're not perfect. And he's going, you're darn right I'm not perfect. You are right. I am not perfect. Fallenness still dwells in me. Temptation still hits me from every side. The things I don't want to do, I do. The things I want to do, I fail to do. And he's saying, you cannot do this in your own power. Now listen to this, picking up in verse 18. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, listen, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So he's given the confession that he struggles in exactly the same way that you and I do. Not as an excuse, but as a way of saying we need to depend on grace. We need to depend more on the Holy Spirit. We need to depend more on Christ dwelling with us in his spirit, inside us, guiding us, showing us the way, enlightening us to scripture, doing all those things because we will inevitably fall to the wrong side given the chance. But it's only when we walk in the Spirit, once we recognize this fallenness that remains in us, our fallen heart that continues to beat in our chest, we can, we can depend on that or we can depend on God's grace and the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. 
Now, I know Paul uses a thousand words to say that, but that's where he's going with this. So listen to this in verse 20. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. We've all experienced that, right? We intend to do the right thing. I think we all get up hopeful that today's the day we're going to do everything right. And then about 30 seconds later, but, but that's what he's saying. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, this is you, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. You've got these two natures, right? Paul's saying you've got this fallen nature and you have this, this new mind of Christ. You have the spirit dwelling there within you. And the two of them are fighting against each other. And this is where sanctification comes in. This is where our transformation and maturity comes in. Gradually, maybe it's, we'll call it 50-50 today. But maybe next week it's 55 45. Uh, I shouldn't do the math here, huh? So, so, you know, it's gradually we grow more and more dependent on the Spirit. We trust in the Spirit more, and we try in our own efforts to do it less. And then we mature, and maybe we stay there for a while, and then we grow a little bit more, and we stay there, and then we grow. And this is the life of transformation. This is how we're changed. And he's describing this, this internal battle, this battle of these two natures going back and forth. This is the battle that you and I face. When Paul gives this confession here, when he lays this out and says, I'm experiencing this, I'm having this difficult time, you and I can see ourselves on these, on these pages. We all want to be good followers of Christ, right? We all want to you know, love one another, love our neighbors. We want to do all those things. But we find ourselves rebelling. We find ourselves sinning intentionally, unintentionally. We find ourselves doing these things. And so this, this two people within us that are battling, right, becomes exhausting. We get disappointed in ourselves. You probably know people who've given up. I said, well, I tried. I tried as hard as I could quote them on that saying, I tried as hard as I could. Well, try less and come to trust in the Holy Spirit more. When we want to give up, when we want to throw up our hands and say, I can't do this anymore. This is too hard. I'm just going to be who I am. That's not what the Bible is telling you. The Bible is telling you, you are who you are, but you don't have to stay that way. You can be transformed to be the person that God wants you to be. God wants us to stop fighting this battle. This is what these kinds of books are all about. Yeah, they're, they're long, and Paul's laying out these things methodically, bit by bit. But in essence, stop trying to fight this battle. You are people of grace. You are people of God's spirit. You are people for whom Jesus died while you were enemies. You are all these things. Live believing that. Trust in that. God doesn't want us to constantly be torn back and forth. That's not his desire. God doesn't, God doesn't want us to, to put our head down and try to muscle through. That's not his intention at all. His intention in giving the Spirit in placing the Spirit so intimately within us is so that we would come to trust that Spirit. Stop trying to do things on our own and start putting more effort into trusting the Spirit, trusting what God says in His Word. And I know that sounds hard. It sounds hard to take that first step in trust, but you've been given all the means You've been all the ways in which you can develop a deeper trust and you can become a, a more trusting person. Number one, admit that you can't live up to God's expectations on your own. 
That's the first step. That's that humility. That's Philippians chapter 2. Admit that you are reliant upon the spirit of Jesus Christ. Admit that. Once you get that in your head, that you cannot do this of your own power, that's step one. And then everything else opens up like that. Step one, be humbled. Lower yourself. Step two, begin to make use of the means of grace that God has given to learn to trust the Spirit more. We, we can read just the New Testament and see what the Holy Spirit has done in all these people. See what Christ has promised on page after page through the New Testament. Then expand it out. Expand your reading out. Bring the Old Testament into that. How has God cared for his people through the centuries? Well, God has been there. God has provided. God has fixed. God has corrected. God has done all these things. But we have to trust him. We have to absolutely trust that what he says is good is good. What he says is bad is bad. And when he says, you need the power of the Spirit... Remember when Jesus is introducing the spirit, the paraclete, the helper, the one that's going to come. Well, it doesn't come like Jesus does externally, where we have to go find it. What's unique about the ministry of the spirit is it comes in you. So as temptation comes your way, as that emotion that you can't get in check comes your way, Spirit. Spirit will tell you, hey, you don't want to do that. Now's an opportunity to have a cool head. Now's an opportunity to look the other way. Now's an opportunity to not take the next step that you're going to do. But you've got to be able to hear that spirit. You've got to be able to trust that the spirit's telling you the right thing. Paul's given us all these complicated things to bring us to this point. Stop trying to do it on your own. You cannot. I cannot. This is what Paul says. I cannot. And that means that you cannot either. You can do these things in grace and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so he does that. He, he brings this thing to this, this huge conclusion. And maybe this is where it makes the most sense. Verse 24, he says, what a wretched What a wretched man I am. You can't imagine the super apostle standing up and saying that. Telling people, he's laying out all this deep theology and, and he wants everybody to trust what he's saying. And what's his confession? What a wretched, wretched man I am. I am the the depths of fallenness. Bless you. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. There's his conclusion. We are people of grace. We have been redeemed by the life and death and resurrection of Christ. We are free from the tyranny of sin. The spirit resides in us. We have this freedom from sin's power. And yet here we stand. Here we stand. All this wonderful gift of grace. True, a reality in the lives of Christians and still finding ourselves being tempted. And he's saying you have to decide to trust God. And God will take care of your sin problem. God will take care of your temptation, will take care of your anger, will take care of your emotion, take care of everything. God will take care of those things. Who will rescue me? Jesus Christ. Who will set me free? Jesus Christ. The answer to our struggle with sin, 
and we all have it, big and small, the answer to our struggle is not to try harder. The answer to our struggle, given by the Apostle Paul right here, is to depend on Jesus. Depend on his spirit because he's the one. He's the one who said he was going to make sure that every one of us gets home safely. He's taken the responsibility. He is accountable for bringing all his people home. He is accountable for bringing us safely to the end of our days, to that point of glorification when we finally get home. It is not us that is to do it. It is to be us trusting in Christ. It is to be us trusting in Jesus who's getting us home. He's the one that promised us life in full. He's the one who gave us his spirit. He's the one who dwells in us and brightens our eyes when we read God's word. He's the one that will remind us of when temptation is creeping into our lives. He's the one that can get our emotions under control. He's the one who brings this word to life week after week. And in me, it is Christ speaking through God's holy, inspired word. And it is him who is with us always. Trust more and try less. So put your pride to the test. Can you humble yourselves? If you can humble yourselves, see if you can benefit from trying less, from putting your head down and pushing through less, and instead trust more in the power of the one who said, he will get you home safely.